actually have no idea where I would be without Jesus. I think about that a lot. I think about what the trajectory of my life would have been had Jesus not gotten a hold of my life. And I mean that so much more than just, oh, someday I'll, I'll get to join Christ in the resurrection. It's, it's so much more than that, just of where I'll get to be someday. But I actually have no idea where I'd be standing today if Jesus had not gotten a hold of my life. And it's mind-blowing to think about. You see, a little over a decade ago, I began the process of going to regular therapy. And one day the therapist looked at me and she said, I actually don't know how you've turned out as well as you have, considering the trauma that you've navigated. Uh, You see, you've heard me talk a lot about my childhood and the good and the happy memories, but something that I don't share very often is a lot of the trauma that I navigated. A lot of the trauma, um, abuse even, uh, and pain that happened in our household and with family members, uh, the amount of addiction that we had in our family, Um, just generations and generations and generations of addiction. And later in life, as I uh, sat across from a therapist, uh, she told me that, she said, I think you have something called complex traumatic stress disorder, uh, which is something that happens over just a series of traumatic events throughout a lifetime. And and oftentimes, those who have complex traumatic stress disorder will, will try to cope in so many different ways. And I think about where the trajectory of my life would have been if it not been for Jesus. Uh, I probably wouldn't have uh, found Jeff. Um, I, I, oft, I actually think that I, it's very possible that I could even be on the streets, um, which I know that sounds like a far stretch, uh, but again, I just think about my family and the amount of family members who have found themselves on the streets uh, and what the trajectory of my life could have been and sometimes I think should have been had Jesus not gotten a hold of my life so radically. And so for me, Jesus has been about a holistic kind of transformation, of mind, of body, of soul. And when Jesus picked me up, literally scooped up my life at 16 years old, right when I was in the middle of so much abuse and pain and abandonment and trauma, even though I couldn't have articulated it then, when Jesus scooped up my life, I knew that there was no turning back. I remember that next morning after saying yes to Jesus, it was like the world was in color for the very first time. I would just have ongoing daily conversations with God, constantly singing to Jesus and praying as I was walking down my high school hallways because I was so in love. And from that point on, I wanted to spend my life telling others about what Jesus had done to my life. Because Jesus had changed my life so much, Jesus had transformed my life so much. I didn't want others to miss out. In fact, I remember telling my parents that I wanted to be like Billy Graham, that I wanted to just get a bus and go from town to town, shout it from the rooftops, and tell everybody, do you know what Jesus has done to my life? And what Jesus has done to my life, Jesus could do to your life too. I have no idea where I'd be without Jesus. And I have no idea where I'd be if it weren't for youth leaders and ministries making space for me, providing communities for me to be formed and shaped in, places to belong. I have no idea where I'd be without this church. I often wonder what would have happened had I not logged on to churchstaffing.com in 2008 and applied to a high school youth ministry leader position. Little did I know that so much of my story would be shaped through the ministry of this place, through you. So many monumental and critical moments in my life link back to this place and to the faithfulness of this church. And then I wonder, how many testimonies do we still yet to hear? And I know that there are thousands of testimonies like mine where where many of you will be able to stand up and say, yeah, I have no idea where my life would be without Jesus too, or I have no idea where my life would be without this church. And what about those who are not yet here? What about those who are still waiting to hear any glimmer of hope for their life, for their future, for their pain? 
What about those who are wondering if this whole thing is real? What about those who are longing also for a place to belong? What about those who are not yet here who will also someday be able to stand before this congregation and say, I have no idea where I would be without Jesus and I have no idea where it'd be without the ministry of this church, Good Shepherd Church. And for me, that is what this Ford Initiative is all about. This is why I so passionately want 100% of engagement. Because I believe that all of us are called and all of us have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit to join Christ on mission, to enter into a weary and hurting world and to go into the dark space of this world and be able to tell people who are despairing and hopeless and tell them that they have reason to hope. Because Jesus has changed my life and Jesus can change your life. And so this forward initiative is about moving forward in faith so we can make room and make space for those who are not yet here. And so we're praying that you'll go on this journey with us with supple hearts, with open hearts, asking the Lord, how can I use my time, my talent, my treasures, my resources for your kingdom and for the advancement of your mission in this world? And I think about a scene in Mark's Gospel, chapter 2. Uh, it's, it's a passage of scripture that we actually read a couple of months ago that I wanted to return to again with some fresh eyes. Because uh, it got me thinking about why we're doing this initiative and what this is all about, what the thrust of this is for us. So let's take a look at Mark's Gospel, chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 2 first. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large, num large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and Jesus preached the word to them. Now, let's pause for a moment and picture this scene. I'm 42 years old, and I can't do crowds anymore. This was a crowded room. Like, I, I, I like Disneyland, I like going to amusement parks, but not if it's crowded. I like concerts, but I like to be kind of like in the back row where I have room to move and I have, have room to breathe. If I walk into a seminar, if I walk into something where it is just wall-to-wall -wall people, I, probably like many of you, turn back around and think, I'm not going in there, I'm going home. Anyone else like that? Like crowded spaces? This was a little different, though, when I was in high school. Uh, maybe crowds didn't affect me so much, but I remember, uh, when, again, when, shortly after Jesus had gotten a hold of my life, I, I was part of a Bible study that happened every Thursday night. And oftentimes, 60, no exaggeration, 60 to 100 students would cram into living rooms to do a verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. All it was was a youth leader sitting on a chair reading the Bible, going verse by verse, and teaching it little by little, and then we would pray. There were no crazy and wild games. There, were, there, was, there, was, um, there was no lights or fog machines. It was just a bunch of high school students crammed into a family room, and we were like shoulder to shoulder, wall to wall, standing room only sometimes. Like you'd have to like kind of stand in the back corner. Why? Because we were all so hungry to experience the power of the word of God. High school students on a Thursday night, we wanted to be fed. And I remember just sitting there in those rooms on those nights, just hearing the word of God with fresh ears for the first time ever and thinking how little I don't know and how I just wanted to be a sponge. I remember I would, I would sit there and I would pray, God, increase my knowledge, increase my wisdom, um, increase my capacity for learning. I'm so hungry for your word. And I imagine this scene somewhat like that. You have all these people crowding into a house. Word has traveled. Word has spread about this teacher who teaches with authority. He has that kind of teaching ability where people, they don't, they don't zone out, they don't fall asleep, but they lean in and they want more. But there was more to it. He wasn't just a teacher, 
But they were crowding because news had traveled about his miracles. News had traveled that he was a prophet. And news had traveled that he was claiming to be the son of God. News had traveled that he was claiming to be the long-awaited Messiah. So this house was crowded because everybody wanted to hang on his words. Everybody wanted to be a sponge and hear from him. Well, there's four friends. Uh, there's, there's four individuals, four men. And they have a friend who is paralyzed. They so desperately wanted, they just, I, I don't know how it started. We don't know. We, we can only guess of, of how this started. But I imagine these, these four guys talking like, we really need to get our friend to the feet of Jesus. And so they, they, I imagine them carrying them to the house and they get there and they look in the door and there's no room. It's too crowded. They could have stopped there. They could have given up. But let's continue. Let's look at verse 3. Some men came, bringing to Jesus a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now this is just a stunning scene. Roofs back then uh, would have been made of thatch and clay. This wasn't just something like a straw roof where they kind of just like lift it up uh, and then they, they, they lowered the man down into it, but they actually had to dig. I don't know if they used sticks, if they would have used rocks, but they had to kind of violently, aggressively dig. And so they broke through so many different challenges because they wanted to lower their friend. They wanted to break through every barrier to get their friend to the feet of Jesus. And the first thing that Jesus says after, after they see them lower this man to him, he says, your sins are forgiven. And then we see total and physical healing from this man. Now, the first thing that Jesus said to him was, your sins are forgiven. This was another way of Jesus extending also spiritual healing for him and salvation to him. And so we know that this moment of the friends lowering the paralytic down to the feet of Jesus, he experiences physical he healing and he also experiences spiritual healing. His life was completely transformed. The trajectory of his life completely changed. Hope is restored here. And I wonder how many years later he testified to others. I have no idea where my life would be without Jesus. I have no idea where my life would be if it were not for my friends inconveniently going out of their way, letting nothing stop them, not the inconvenience or the exhaustion of carrying me, not the inconvenience of a crowded home, not even a roof. I have no idea where I would be if not for Jesus. Got me to thinking, what are some of the roofs and barriers that keep us from bringing others to the feet of Jesus? What are some of the roofs and barriers that keep us from living into this great commission? You hear me talk about the great commission all the time because I'm so passionate. I believe that Jesus meant these words for us today, that we should make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And one of the things one of my favorite Old Testament scholars, Christopher Wright, says. He says that the mission is God's and it requires the committed participation of God's people. In other words, it's not just this haphazard event, but God actually calls real people, real humans, in real locations, in everyday ordinary places, to actually actively participate in the mission of God. In other words, God actually needs us to get in the game. God doesn't want to sideline church. God doesn't want sideline Christians, but God actually wants us to get in the game. And so what are those roofs 
And what are those barriers then that keep us sidelined? Or what are those roofs or those barriers that keep us from leading people to Jesus? I think, I think number one, I think we could say fear of rejection. We're, we're, we're afraid. And I get it. I've experienced it. I've invited people to church and uh, they, you know, they, they push me off, they push me off, they push me off. Um, I've invited people to church and then they don't come back. Uh, if I've invited people to church and they say, oh no, it's not a good time, or I'll tell someone about Jesus and they get real mad and, and real defensive and tell me all the ways that uh, they think Christianity is ridiculous. I think we all have kind of those Rolodex of fears. Uh, I think also just our comfort zone. We, we don't want to get out of our comfort zone. Um, you know, we get like really just locked into the rhythms and the patterns of our life. And to break out of those rhythms and to break out of those patterns can be hard. Uh, I think another one is busyness. And in particular, I'm talking about like the Christian kind of busyness, the church kind of busyness. Uh, Christians are really, really, really good at filling their calendars uh, with more church things, uh, doing things for Jesus. To the point that when it comes to rubbing shoulders with people maybe who aren't part of the church, our lives are too full to invest in them. And so we get so inward. I think another one is doubt. We, we wonder, how will it, I mean, yeah, God's changed my life, but can God really help them in this way? Or, or how about, can God really use me? Which leads to insecurity. It's our fifth one. Uh, I think we sometimes have imposter syndrome. We think, well, I don't know as much about the Bible as Pastor Tara Beth. Uh, and so who am I to tell others about Jesus? I don't have those kind of gifts. Uh, I, I won't be able to help someone. I won't be able to answer their questions. And so we get insecure. And finally, I think just at the heart of all of this is apathy. I think all of these things just eventually lead to apathy where we kind of give up. And I sometimes wonder how often God is like, I told you that you would receive power. I promised you that you would receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Friends, we have been given the gift of the power from the Holy Spirit. We have a junk drawer at home. Um, It's the drawer where I just uh, hide everything, pretty much, that I don't want on the counters. I like really clean counters and like I am known for, you know, just uh, hiding hammers in the junk drawer because I don't want my husband to put it there and it drives him crazy. But anyway, one of the things that fills up our junk drawer is cards, gift cards. And oftentimes these are gift cards for places that are maybe far away and we think, oh, you know, maybe it's a couple hours away and so we'll kind of put it in the junk drawer or maybe it's not a place that we frequent very often so we'll put it in the junk drawer. And honestly, I think there might be some gift cards in there that we've been transferring over the 15 years of our marriage just from house to house to house. Like, we don't even know what some of those restaurants are. Uh, They're so old, but we just can't seem to get rid of them, you know, just in case. And uh, I read a statistic that there are $200 billion worth of unused gift cards in America. $200 billion. In fact, two-thirds of Americans say that they they at least have one uh, unused gift card. I think that other one-third is either lying or they've never been given the gift of a gift card in their life. Because, I mean, come on, how many of you have an unused gift card at home that's maybe been sitting in a drawer for a little too long? Okay, there we go, there we go. Um, One article said this, gift cards are extremely popular and almost everybody enjoys getting them, but many people leave them sitting in a drawer to redeem on a special occasion. I think so many of us, Forget about the power of the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And God is like, I've given it to you. I've told you that if you lack wisdom, you can ask for it. That if you lack creativity, you can ask for it. I told you that you would do even greater things than these. And we just leave it. Apathetically, sitting on the sidelines. Where God is calling us to get into the game. And lean into the power of the Holy Spirit. So there are other roofs that I think that we we have. There are church roofs, corporate roofs. Uh, Number one, I think about just the corporate fear of change. Um, We think, yeah, we want to be a growing church. Yeah, we want to be a thriving church. Yeah, we want to reach others for Jesus. Yeah, we want to make space for the next generation. Yes, we want this church to be here 40, 60, 70 years from now, but don't change. Don't move my cheese. (laughs) 
don't change my preferences. And we, we say, yeah, we're willing to grow, but just not that. Or I think inward focus. We get so wrapped up in the internal affairs of the church. We get so wrapped up in the politics of the church that we forget about our mission out there. I think sometimes we choose tradition over mission. We hold so tightly to our traditions, which traditions are good, but it should never be at the expense of the mission of God. Let me say that again. Traditions are good, but it should never be at the expense of the mission of God. I think that division and also judgmental attitudes also keep us from living into the Great Commission. I also think it keeps others from wanting to come in. Uh, it's like they, they look into the, the politics of the church and they see the, the division. Uh, they see the, the judgmental attitudes and they have no interest in being part of that. I think another one is, is consumerism. We ourselves, we just get so wrapped up in what's in it for me that we forget that the question should be, what about for others? That it's not always just about me. See, this forward initiative is about naming and removing those roofs so that we can make space for others. So that we can make space for others to testify that they have no idea where they would be without Jesus. Which is why moving forward in faith is about being for our neighbors. It's about being for our neighbors, the struggling families. It's about being for the world, and it's about being for one another. Not about having an inward focus, but an outward one. The inward work and the discipleship journey that we want all of you to go on is one of introspection and asking of the Lord, how can I make space? How can I make space in my life? How can I make space in my finances? How can I make space in my schedule so that we can move forward in faith and join God in this mission that we are called into? To be for our neighbors, for the world, and for 1310. And so for us, we believe that moving forward in faith is a willingness and a posture to go wherever God leads with complete openness and suppleness, being willing to remove any barrier or any roof that keeps us from going wherever God leads. Why? So that we'll constantly hear the testimonies. I don't know where I would be without Jesus. I don't know where I would be if not the ministry of this church. Let's hear about another one of those testimonies from Creighton and Gina Getting. I'm Creighton Getting, and this is my wife, Gina. We have three kids, Taylor, CJ, and Nolan. We've been going to Good Shepherd as a family for the past 20 years. Our husband's been attending for about the past 30. One thing we love about Good Shepherd mm -hmm. is the fact that you feel the Holy Spirit being present. Um, and you feel that in multiple ways. Going to a church that has that presence in the building and in the people. I walk in these doors and it feels like coming home. Attending Good Shepherd for 30 years, there's been many significant moments in our faith journey. I would probably lean into the one that Pastor Gary really kind of leaned into for me, which was uh, a mission trip to Honduras. And through that, um, really saw how the Honduras people are just unbelievably happy and just filled with joy, even though they have hardly anything. That helped to open my eyes that I needed to change the vision and the pursuit and focus more on a relationship with Christ. And that's on that trip is actually when I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. And then when I came back, I went on a date with my wife. <laughs> See, it's because of Good Shepherd that we're together. We actually met at our 10-year high school reunion. He talked about how he was going on this mission trip to Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and I was like, well, I was just in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. So we had our first date talking about that, and yeah. about eight months later, we're engaged. <laughs> when I first started attending, the, the conversations with generosity 
really went into three categories. It's time, talents, and treasures. And if you keep your heart open, God's gonna put something on your heart. And that's the thing that I love about coming to Good Shepherd and having that lived out in Good Shepherd is because you have those opportunities, whether it's to serve with uh, you know, crazy junior hires or to give every month or whether it's to make a connection to compassion. Our talents through those things are when you actually get to identify those talents. When God pours in to you the abundance of resources, joy, grace, it becomes natural, not always easy, but it becomes natural to want to generously share what has been given to you. There's tremendous joy in that. And God's called us to be generous. And so when we do what God has called us to do, the life that we live is fuller. And to think. Let's get this going. And to think, a mission trip to Honduras with an invitation from Pastor Gary led to whole transformation, family transformation, and story after story after story. And I know that so many of you have stories just like that. And we don't want to stop. We don't want to stop ever until we know that we have done all that we can to make room for others to make room in our lives with our time and our schedules, to make room with the gifts and the talents that God has given us, and to make room with our treasures and our resources for the sake of the world and the advancements of God's mission in this world.